This program contains tribal nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. The wilds of planet Earth are spectacular. Yet one species is always framed out of the picture. Us. I'm Dr. M. Sanjan. As a scientist and conservationist, I've dedicated the past 25 years of my life to studying oh. and protecting the wildlife I love. Hold on, buddy. <laughs> now, my mission is to tell you an untold story. What we think of as wild has actually, over centuries, been shaped by humans. We can be destructive, but by changing our perspective, we can learn to restore nature back to health in the most surprising ways. Forests are home to more variety of wildlife than anywhere else on terrestrial Earth. The challenge is how to live alongside them without cutting them down. I am discovering new ways of understanding and valuing forests whilst they're still standing all part of a new kind of wild. In the far western reaches of the Amazon rainforest lies one of the remotest places on Earth. It's many days by boat just to get here. A place simply known as the intangible zone. It really is a perfect name, the intangible zone, because you look at that forest and it just looks unknowable. And it contains millions and millions of life forms. And you can't help but feel very, very small in a place that looks very, very big. You can't just walk straight into the intangible zone. Because even out here, with over a hundred miles of rainforest between us and the nearest town, there are people, gatekeepers to this forest, who will fiercely protect it. People have been killed here for venturing into the intangible zone. My guide, Ryan Kalaki, assures me that we are invited. He spent years getting to know this forest and earning the trust of the Warani people who live here. But you never know how something like this is actually gonna go. Just the forest for hours and hours of endless green, and then all of a sudden, people, humans, just out of the forest. Oh, Bonnie! Oh, my God. Is it okay to go up there? Yeah. Almost. It turns out to be about the warmest welcome I could ever imagine. So this is Otobo's wife and his son. This is Otobo's mother. And this is Otobo. So this is... This is Otobo's family. Yeah, this is, yeah, this is Otobo. 
This is Tobo and this is his family. Oh. <laughs> The Warani people get everything they need from this forest, and I'm here to learn from them. I want to understand an astonishing theory that suggests we humans may have lived here in the Amazon, not just in small communities like Otobo's community, but in much larger numbers, bigger than anyone previously thought. And it's what my journey is really all about, exploring wild forests that include humans. Because the research at these frontiers is reinventing the value of forests for all of us. Exploring this forest with Lotobo is really about just keeping up. If I turn my eyes for even a minute, I'll lose them in the forest. And I did this once before. I just looked back and I looked forward and they were gone. And so I got to keep an eye on them because these guys just vanish like that. Otobo and his uncles can read every detail of this place. Four o'clock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it said four o'clock yesterday. A bunch of animals came by here and rubbed against this. And he can tell that from the smell and the fact that he can time it. I, I wouldn't believe him, but I've seen these guys in the forest and it's just, this is absolutely, absolutely incredible. And so I'm, I'm very much inclined to, to believe what they're telling me. <laughs> I've asked Otobo for a quick tour of his forest. And he takes me to a very special place. This muddy clearing attracts animals from miles around. By licking the minerals in the soil, the animals get a vital hit of nutrients. Spider monkeys feed on toxic leaves and need the minerals here to neutralize those toxins. As a biologist, I see a forest dripping with life. It's exceptionally hot and wet in this region of the Amazon. Optimum conditions for the generation of life. Species were thought to have survived here through the Ice Age, while in other parts of the Amazon, they perished. This explains why the intangible zone is thought to be the most biologically diverse place on Earth. And today, a team of scientists from three continents are coming here to test the claim. Ryan Kilaki is leading the team. He's organized the expedition because he fears the fate of the Warani's home hangs in the balance. Because on the fringes of the intangible zone, there's another expedition underway. Oil prospectors are approaching. They value this forest 
for the natural resources beneath it. The researchers are the first to catalogue life here. For Ryan, it's much more than that. For him, it's a race to confirm the scientific value of this place with hard data. We really know so little about it, and, and right now it is labelled as possibly the single most biologically diverse location in the world. You know, we have over 150 species of amphibians, and like over 200 species of reptiles, 200 species of mammals, over, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of plant species and hundreds of thousands of insects. Nobody has really ever been in here before, so what I, what I do need to do is bring people in here that can give us that hard scientific data. The Warani's understanding of this forest makes them the best field guides a scientist could ever hope for. Dr. Cecilia Puertas is after fish. And Otobo's grandmother, Miniemo, has a pretty neat trick. Pounded tree roots release toxins into the water that starve the fish of oxygen. Then, they can simply be tickled up to the surface. <laughs> Miniemo is clearly a pro. For Cecilia, each of these fish is a priceless bit of data. Well, this is great. I mean, sometimes I have to spend hours and hours trying with the net just to get one fish. And here in uh, less than 10 minutes, was well, right? We already have like four or five different species. Amazing. The scientists are only halfway through their expedition and the specimen count is already off the scale. Frogs that look like leaves. Birds that mimic trees. Spiders that look more like flies. I'm going to see for myself what all these discoveries finally add up to. And I will be traveling to the frontiers of where the world of the Warani meets the world of the oil prospector. But before that, there's another lead to follow, a discovery from the past that is changing our perception about how many people can live in and around a forest. Across human history, our relationship with the forest has often been about clearing them for things like firewood and agriculture. And I think the general opinion in the Amazon has always been that, just like the Warani, the only way people can live in forests is in these small nomadic hunter-gatherer communities with a pretty limited impact on the surrounding forest. New evidence coming out of the Amazon, quite ironically as it's being deforested, suggests that in the past it might have supported vastly larger human communities. This evidence emerged from what we'd previously thought was virgin rainforest. It reveals something unexpected and mysterious. Let's take a look at these and see what they really look like. We 
look at that. There's just no doubt that these were human made. I mean, those lines are perfectly straight. I mean, it is a perfect square. Archaeologists have dated some of these shapes at 2,000 years old. It's thought that they might have been ceremonial structures, although what's important here is not their purpose, but their scale. I mean, look at the size of these. And when you realize that these are big, tall, tropical trees, then you realize how actually big these trenches, these earthworks are. To build on a scale like this takes planning, organization, and a lot of people. You know, scientists are estimating that it's maybe like 60,000 people must have been around in these areas to be able to excavate things this big. More and more of these earthworks are emerging. Now 300 and counting. They date from before Christopher Columbus. And they suggest that communities, tens of thousands strong, may have lived around these structures. Perhaps they were even small cities. And that's astonishing, because the Amazon soil is so poor and thin. Not what you need to support large numbers of people. Research into this soil has shown that ancient people found a simple solution to feed so many. They slowly burnt their domestic waste in pits amongst intact forests. Over time, this created a super fertile, man-made soil known as terra preta, or dark earth. Ancient communities could reap the benefits of this mosaic of orchards interspersed in the heart of the jungle. And it turns out that 10% of what we often think of as pristine wilderness is actually growing in man-made soil. All this shows that there are ways to coexist with force without destroying them even ways to make them more vibrant. And if you think that this could only happen in the past, you'd be wrong. Five thousand miles away, there's a remarkable story of how humans and forests can coexist. Man's impact here makes this place more diverse than if there were no people here at all. In southern Europe, it's the start of the cork harvest season. For centuries, these trees have provided cork for wine bottles. Harvesting it is a tradition handed down from father to son. These tiradors or cork harvesters have to use absolute precision to cut the bark without damaging the trees. And the harvesting is good for the tree. Just like cutting grass, the bark eventually grows back better. The cork is the tree's natural defense against forest fires. It's so effective that's even been used as a heat shield in spacecraft. Come 
The cork harvest is part of a multi-million dollar industry. And because the cork trees are so valuable, the other agricultural activities have to fit around them. It creates a patchwork of small clearings that scientists call a mosaic ecosystem. Farmers graze pigs between the cork trees. They eat the acorns and naturally reseed the forest. And having bits of small-scale agriculture interwoven with healthy forests is what makes it so good for wildlife. It's a last stronghold for the endangered Iberian lynx. They use the trees for camouflage and the clearings for hunting. Sixty thousand Eurasian cranes end their long migration here, stocking up on cork oak acorns. Cranes need the man-made clearings to dance and reaffirm their lifelong bonds. This region is also home to more wild plants than the rest of Europe combined. It's why it's been called the Amazon of Europe. What's so fantastic about these cork forests is that these forests really need people to maintain all that life, to function the way they do. You take people out of the equation, without a doubt, these forests are gone. And for me, that's kind of really special, right? I mean, here are these forests where people are the ones who are maintaining it, who are keeping it, in some ways, wild. Humans have played a key role in creating this forest ecosystem. But in the 1950s, we inadvertently upset the natural balance. Rabbits had become a pest, and so we introduced a disease, myxomatosis, to control their numbers. But it got out of control, and in some areas, wiped out 90% of them. And it was here that the rabbits of Europe first evolved and became an integral part of this ecosystem. Carlos Pacheco is a scientist who's trying to pick up the pieces because the loss of rabbits has had this knock-on effect on all the key predators that feed on them. Like the Iberian lynx. And the Spanish Imperial Eagle. These hunters are both at extreme risk. Carlos and others are working to restore the predator-prey balance. But Carlos's help goes much further than rabbits. For the Spanish imperial eagle, he's even building nests for them to return to. Today, with a team of researchers, he's watching a nest containing a precious eagle chick that has yet to fly. And the researchers need to give it a full health checkup. But getting an eagle chick down from the top of a tree, that ain't easy. I do get very excited about doing this, although I try not to show it because I'm a professional. <laughs> but uh, yeah, my heart is beating much faster than it normally does. The mother will aggressively defend her nest with her razor-sharp talons. 
As soon as she leaves, the scientists have a 30-minute window to get the chick down and back up again. Even a youngster is a handful. Blood samples can track its genetic history, while physical tags allow researchers to follow a bird from afar. Oh, this is a unique moment. It's something that uh, makes your hands shiver. <laughs> I really uh, get very excited when, uh, when this job is done and uh, we see these chicks flying. Man's intervention here has restored eagle numbers from almost 40 pairs to nearly 400. Managing the predators is an extension of our timeless involvement in these forests. An age-old industry functions with an understanding of the wild animals that live alongside. But living next to forests doesn't always play out quite so easily. In some parts of the world, if you really want to live next door to nature, live side by side with wild creatures, then you have to start thinking pretty radically. In the jungles of Sumatra, the wildlife of the forest is much more difficult to get along with. Elephants are bursting out of the forest and crossing the threshold into our world. The reason is that Sumatra has some of the fastest disappearing rainforest on earth, cleared for huge plantations and farmland. More and more people are now living closer to elephants. And unfortunately, elephants find our crops irresistible. When they come raiding, lives are at stake. Farmers feel they have to fight back, sometimes with rockets and firecrackers, because getting a five-ton elephant back into the forest is hard. In less than 10 years, human-elephant conflict has killed 42 people and over 100 elephants here. These animals can devastate farmlands, obliterate years of work in just minutes. However much the people try to protect their livelihoods by scaring them off, the reality is they don't stay away for long. Sejarah dulu itu pun kurang tahu kalau soal datu itu. Ya datu itu ya gajah cuma kan sejarahnya itu. Gajah itulah sejarahnya datu. Jadi Kita sini mau ngejar dia. Harus kita atrek. You might think life here for people would be easier if they just got rid of elephants. But it turns out these animals are deeply connected to the health of the rainforest, and in turn, to all of us. Unless we can get elephants back into the forest, we all suffer. And again, just like with the cork forest, it's our ability to manage the wild that provides the solution. Because there is a plan.
It's called the Elephant Flying Squad. The trainers, or mahouts, have an intimate bond with domesticated elephants. Using skills handed down across millennia, they can turn these animals into allies and use them to push their wild cousins back into the jungle. At Flying Squad headquarters, they wait for reports to come back in from watchtowers that are spread across the forest. And then it's about making their strategy work on the front line. Here, they're patrolling the Teso Nilo district. And once again, there are problems. The flying squad have got to respond quickly because things here can get out of hand rapidly. With elephants and people working together, there is a solution for pushing the wild elephants back into the forest. And the flying squad are succeeding. Flying squad efforts in some places have reduced crop damage by over 90%. This is good news for the people and the forest. Because elephants are ecosystem engineers. They create clearings for new growth. And disperse seeds. Even their footprints create breeding grounds for insects that all contribute to forest health. By gardening the forest, elephants are contributing to a tropical network that supports us by supplying and regulating billions of gallons of water every day. But there's another equally important band of forests that for years has been overlooked. Great forests encircling the entire northern hemisphere of our planet. For six months of the year, they're frozen. They appear lifeless. But when this place thaws, it exhales a giant breath, flooding the planet with oxygen. This is the Earth breathing. No other force, not even the Amazon, regulates our atmosphere on this scale. I've come to Canada's Great Bear Rainforest because research has helped us understand this place and value it in a whole new way. This new understanding has led to a historic agreement between loggers, indigenous people, and conservationists 
to protect it. It's all based on an incredible chain of events that starts in spring. The forest is awakening. And the stage is set for one of nature's most spectacular events. Animals lean after a long winter are on the move to the coast. And that includes us. The First Nations people living here are combining the latest science with an ancestral understanding to reveal a whole new way of looking at this forest. They've helped expose a link between the life in the ocean and life in the deepest parts of this forest. Because here, a small fish helps support one of the biggest stretches of forest on Earth. She goes that beautiful tree. That beautiful tree. All the animals here seem to instinctively know what's coming. The Pacific Herring Run. Shoals of herring, tens of millions strong, coming right into the shore to where the ocean meets the Great Bear Rainforest. Their arrival provides a banquet. It is chock full of life. And these forests sometimes look so empty, and then you get into these little spots, and everyone is here. Look at these guys. Look at this. Look at this. Wow. humpback whale over there. He's just cruising up and down through the channel, just feeding. The male herring that do manage to make it head into the shallows to release their sperm. Then the females follow. They scramble for any surface they can on this boundary with the forest, like seaweed and fallen trees. They release their eggs in the hope that they will be fertilized. Each tiny egg is part of a vast fabric clinging to the shoreline. Millions per square yard. This immense spawn connects ocean and forest along hundreds of miles of coast. A connection that in time will be transported deep into the forest. footage is extremely rare. An iconic carnivore turning its attention to fish is not something you see every day. And other animals are just as keen on the herring as the wolves. From eagles to black bears to one other animal. 
Us. That is like a hundred pounds. There's a hundred pounds of caviar. Wow! Mm. It's good. <laughs> it's the mildest flavored caviar with just a little bit of pine. I mean, it really, really tastes great. It really tastes of the ocean and the forest. There's nothing like it. The Heltsuk are a First Nations community who have lived alongside this forest for millennia. And they've come to know its most intimate details. At this time of the year, they're all out harvesting on the water. We have a, we have a big family. All these guys that were over here are my uncles. Yeah. So when we get in, all of the eggs that they harvested and all of this are going to go onto one table, and all of our family will come and come and take what what they need for the winter. William Housty is a leader of the Heltsuk people. Ancestral knowledge has taught the Heltsuk that when the crescent moon is waning, the herring are on their way. And that's the time to sink the trees. Have you ever watched the moon leading up to this time of year? Our people used to know that it was time to go out and get your trees ready. Because when the moon tipped, all the herring came spilling out of the moon and then they were starting to spawn. Even though the Heltsuk are fishermen, they know the forest is crucial to the herring run. Trees anchor soil and prevent silt from running into the water. The spawning just wouldn't happen like it does if the water was cloudy with silt. But the Heltsuk know that there's a much more complex connection between the ocean and the forest. Scientists working with the Heltsuk have analyzed the chemical composition of the trees inland and they've made an astonishing discovery. That the nutrients essential to the growth of the trees, even miles inland, comes from the ocean. The herring start the process. Salmon feed on those herring. Then they swarm up the rivers, carrying the pulse of nutrients deep into the forest where bears are waiting. All along the animal trails here, you find remains of half-eaten, ocean-going fish. Up to two tons in a single acre. It's these that decompose and then feed the trees. It turns out that up to a staggering 75% of the nitrogen that fuels the growth of these trees comes from the ocean. There are millions upon millions of herring and salmon that spawn up and down these coastlines. And animals bring that nutrient up into these trees. I mean, to me, that is just absolutely mind-boggling that the ocean that is that far away from me really manages to reach right up into these forests all the way to the very tips of these trees. We used to value this wilderness only for its worth as raw materials, making everything from plywood to toilet paper. Now, we're starting to appreciate these trees whilst they're still alive and part of a bigger system. If the forest was gone, it would bring soil erosion, destroy salmon and herring runs, and eliminate a multi-million dollar fishery. 
The reality of these discoveries linking forests, oceans, and us has meant that five million acres have been made off limits to logging. We can now appreciate what our forests are really worth. Something that's coming back into sharp focus where my journey began. Back in Ecuador's intangible zone, the value of this forest is suddenly a lot more significant since Ryan Kalaki's team got here. There are more tree species in just a couple of acres than in all of North America. More variety of insects than anywhere else on the planet. No doubt more studies will be needed, but even after just a couple of weeks, Ryan and his team believe that this might be the most biodiverse place on terrestrial Earth. It's the sort of place where giant river otters <laughs> swim right up to you. But another expedition has revealed that underneath this forest, lies several billion dollars worth of oil. Fuel for our world and the source of much needed cash for this country. There's one man in the Warani community who's experienced this collision of values like no one else has. The Jaguar Shaman. As a biologist, I usually focus on natural history. But the shaman reminds me of the human story that is also threatened by development in this forest. When he came across outsiders prospecting for oil, it didn't go well. <laughs> As far as he is concerned, he was defending his people from invasion and certainly drives home the challenges that could be coming the way of this forest. He leads us towards the edge of his land and then leaves us to journey out of the intangible zone. Oil drilling is already happening at the edges, but permits are now being considered for drilling further into the forest. Surveys have revealed vast deposits. It all raises the question of what the most biologically diverse forest on Earth is actually worth to us. Wow, flaming trees, huh? It's kind of beautiful. You know, in a way, like yeah. we all are kind of hypnotized by fire. But, you know, we're all part of it. We're all part of it. And they say the quantity of oil is only enough for the, the, the world population to actually function for about eight days. Just eight days of oil? Just eight days of oil. But eight days of oil for the planet is still a great deal of money. The roads and massive development that comes with oil extraction does make this a pretty destructive way to put a dollar value on this forest. But there is a new way to put a cash value on forests. One that capitalizes on scientific data, like Ryan's. And promisingly, it's emerging right here in the Amazon, where they're facing the big threats like oil and logging 
head on. It's easy, it seems, to calculate the value of a forest when it's your home. A vida. Life. Life. No, the forest is life. Vida, né? Chief Almir is the leader of Brazil's Surui tribe, and he's been quick to realize that he needs to quantify the value of his home to the rest of the world. The Surui lead a traditional life. But now they're using modern technology to help them quantify the value of their home and broadcast that to the rest of the world. Dentro do programa do meio ambiente, aí nós buscamos We looked at how we wanted to preserve the standing forest and we came up with the idea of the Surui Carbon Project. The Surui take simple measurements like the height and growth rate of trees and an algorithm translates that into the weight of carbon drawn from the atmosphere. Almost a million dollars worth of carbon credits have already been sold to offset carbon use. The Surui are the first indigenous group to ever protect forests in this way. But this is just a small part of a bigger plan. A massive data entry exercise is now underway. Uploading the inventories of forest life via satellite. With this monitoring, we can map the biodiversity of Surui territory. By getting hold of this sort of data, businesses are basing patents on forest life. It's thought one quarter of all our prescribed medicines are based on rainforest plants. And yet fewer than 1% of tropical species have really been examined. When the data of this forest is uploaded, it clearly has a dollar value. The Surui are smart. They know the forest adds up to more than just money. But if this helps them protect their home, then they'll take that too. This new kind of assessment of even the wildest forests is spreading right across the planet. Economists call it natural capital. This is the forest not just as trees and wildlife, it's really a way of putting a figure on every service this ecosystem can provide. From hydroelectric power to water filtration, from medicine banks to global weather control, to tourism. The way of valuing force is changing. In the modern world, we can quantify the forest services to us. And new evidence shows how we can keep them productive, living amongst them in large numbers, and sometimes even making them more diverse. Today, it's all about how to value forests while they're still standing. Next time on Earth, a new wild. Our planet's last wild frontier, the ocean. A place threatened by a man-made invasion. But we can turn back the tide. And the key is a new understanding of the ocean's predators. I cannot believe what I'm seeing. Allowing us and the wildest oceans to thrive. To learn more about this program, visit pbs.org slash earth a new wild.
Earth, A New Wild is available on Blu-ray and DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.